Biometric Touch ID has been a great feature on Apple's laptops for years. I believe it was introduced in 2016, but it only works when the laptop is open. If it's in clamshell mode, or if you find yourself using a desktop Mac, Apple sells several of those, up until very recently, you've been out of luck. Now, you can auto unlock and also approve password requests on your Mac with an Apple Watch, and it actually, it really does work quite well. But not everyone owns or finds themselves wearing an Apple Watch at all times like they do their fingers, table saw operators excluded. So Apple's answer was this, the Magic Keyboard with Touch ID released last year. And it's actually great. That is if you're a lad or lassie that enjoys Apple's desktop keyboards. But surprise, surprise, many people are not fans of this keyboard and I'm amongst them. And while I certainly appreciate the inventiveness of my peers that are Velcroing this keyboard to the bottom of their desk and using software to disable key input, I wanted to make a dedicated Touch ID module. One that could look good and fit into a small footprint, but most importantly, one that finds itself close to where my hands actually are, my keyboard, so that I don't have to reach under and hunt around for this Touch ID key. I don't really want this. I want something like this. And so we need a Touch ID sensor, which means, unfortunately, a magic keyboard with Touch ID. This is the only place we can harvest them from. And because these are new, they're still relatively expensive. I did get mine for a hundred bucks, which is $50 off retail from someone on Craigslist that didn't need theirs and got it with an iMac. Luckily, these are notoriously unreliable. So in short order, we will see a flood of these hit the market with crumbs and spills and broken keys. And that's fine, that doesn't matter because all we need is the logic board, the battery, and the Touch ID sensor, or at least in theory. I don't know, I haven't taken one apart yet. Ho ho ho, brand new. And we're gonna harvest its guts, unfortunately, but such is the way these things work. <laughs> As you might suspect, there are no, no screws under here. There's no way to get into here other than to just, I mean, look at this. I don't, these might even be like molded on, there we go. There's our in, there is a hole there, but there's no screws. So we're gonna need to heat up the adhesive on the back of this panel to get in. And we're gonna do that with this thing. Uh, basically we touch this button and it gets mighty toasty, mighty quickly. Oh my gosh, this is getting so warm. It is Boeing, isn't it? Look at that. It's saying, please stop. Wow, look at that. It's not straight anymore. Ho, 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 mama. Beautiful, elegant, graceful. Glue, isn't it great? Oh my goodness. Easy. It's injected molded plastic for rigidity. We've got our battery connector, presumably right there. Let's see if we can uh, pull this up first. There you go, look at that. Yeah, no problem. Oh man, there are a lot of these. Like, so many. Like, why'd you put all of these in and then decide to glue it together? There we go. There are plastic snaps though on top of that. Oh, look at that. I was like, oh no, I destroyed the battery. Nope, your battery's on the back of this. And look at this, there's a little pull tab. We do want to use this battery if we can. I plan on using this wired. I would like to make a wireless option available. Spicy pillows are bad. We don't want any spicy pillows. So we're just gonna keep working this its way down without puncturing the battery. There we go. Wow. Look at how thin this is. Look at that. That's so thin. This is a 793 milliamp hours. Wow. Okay, here's the good stuff. An interesting. <laughs> ah. This is a different logic board than the one you find in the regular smaller Apple keyboard. Um, that one is a little more square and not quite as elongated, which for our purposes would be better. But this is what we have. So maybe I'll have to take apart a small one too, shall we?
Now we've got to remove the one, two, three connectors. One goes to the Touch ID sensor itself. That's on the back of this board. The battery one we've already removed. This appears to be to the lightning connector by which you charge the case. And then we've got this big ZIF connector for the entire, presumably, keyboard. And here is our logic board. It's very thin. It's extremely flexible. Look at that. Ooh, hoo, hoo, you don't want to break that. And then we've got our Touch ID sensor right here and our lightning connector. Ha <laughs> ha ha, there it is, our lightning connector. The last thing remaining, other than, well, the entire keyboard, is the Touch ID sensor. Now this is held in by four T3 screws. You can actually see the key switch mechanism work if you push on the back of the board, which is pretty funny. So let's undo these perimeter screws, and in theory, it should come right out drops all the way through. And in fact, it looks like I could entirely remove this key fascia. Yeah, look at this. I'm not sure I want to do this, but you can. There we have it. Now we have a bare Touch ID sensor. You can touch the top for fingerprint recognition, and then at the back, you've still got that little button, and as long as something is there on the back of it to depress it, it registers a button press. Speaking of buttons, Use the button on your mouse to click through to today's sponsor, Enreal. The Enreal Air is a pair of lightweight, high-resolution micro-display OLED panels inside of an AR glasses frame. And they've got a public beta of their Nebula app for Mac, which allows you to virtualize up to three displays without actually having to have anything on your desk. Being able to see through the glasses, through the screens when needed, keeps you in the real world, unlike VR. And the pixels per degree value is triple that of leading VR headsets, so the text is razor sharp. This means you can actually be productive and increase your productivity on a plane or in a small office or anywhere you can't have multiple screens. It also works with iPhone and Android as the perfect theater experience. Put on the blackout cover and enjoy a display that seems like it's theater-sized, with an infinite contrast ratio thanks to those OLED panels, extremely luminous highlights, and shockingly good comfort. Then, when you're done watching your movies, plug it into your Valve Steam Deck and play games on a larger, higher quality screen that uses less energy than the display built into your Steam Deck. If you want to learn more what the Enreal Air can do for you, check out this recent video we did on them, and then use the link in the video description to purchase them for yourself, or as the perfect holiday gift for the techie in your life. Okay, so one thing I didn't test before pulling this whole thing apart was, does this even work without a keyboard attached to it? I don't know. I've never actually even programmed this to a computer before. It's never been plugged in. So let's try it. <laughs> it does say keyboard battery level 0%. That's funny. All right, now if we go into Touch ID, I have to enroll a fingerprint, right? So if I push Add Fingerprint, let's see if this even works. You ready? It does. Okay. So. It does appear to be enrolling my fingerprint. Keep going, okay. It's hard to do when the fingerprint reader sticks to your finger. Okay, now I can push done, and now it's enabled. So let's go to the lock screen, and then theoretically, I should be able to just touch this. I don't even have to push the button down. And it, <laughs> it works. Okay, so I can do it on both. I can do it high here, or turn off, good. I can do it right. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, now that we've gotten all of our pieces removed from our keyboard, it is time to make our 3D model. All of these pieces are square, so why don't we start with a square? Or maybe we can start with a spell. Abracadabra, Alakazam! Wow, 3D modeling is so easy. It only took me a whole week to make this part. <laughs> okay, this is actually the first 3D model I have ever made. You can see all of my failed attempts. Mm revisions and improvements over here on the right. It took a lot of printing, a lot of trial and error, but I've finally gotten a part that I'm pretty happy with. And a lot of that is thanks to the software that I'm using, Shaper 3D, which was super easy for me, a total beginner that, again, has never modeled anything. Let me show you how Shaper 3D works. I'm gonna go into the sketch panel here with my Apple Pencil, and I can either create a line or an arc. An arc is a, a circle, so let's make a circle here. And then we are going to notice that there's been a 2D object created on this infinite plane. I can tap this 2D object, and if I 
drag it in one direction or the other, it creates a 3D model. This is a little cylinder. I can pan around it. I can see how tall it is, 57 millimeters. If I wanted to make it, I don't know, 60, there you go. It gets a little bit taller. I can choose the radius of the circle. I can choose if it's tilted or slanted or what have you. And then once I'm happy with my shape, I go, wow, okay, but what if I wanna make a hole out of this shape or make it a different size? Well, all I have to do is double tap on it and I enter another 2D plane. I can then make my uh, new shape. Let's make a, an arc. Well, let's make a little like, I don't know. How about this? And then we draw a little, yeah, there we go. Okay, sure, that looks like a thing I wanna take out of my part. We can see again that this is another 2D part that's in 3D space. So if I tap this, I can drag it in one direction, which would create additive manufacturing. It's a new piece of our model. Or I can drag it in the other direction and you'll see that it's subtractive. I am taking a part away from the cylinder that I just created in the shape that I model. And that's really all there is to 3D modeling. It's additive, it's subtractive, and that's pretty much it. Now I can go in here and fine tune this. Let's tap this edge. Let's say I wanna give it a little bit of a bevel. There you go, that's nice. Or let's say I wanna, Give it a little bit of a, an aggressive cut. I can do that too. The world is really your oyster, but that's really all it is. It's, it's very, very simple. Add, subtract, chamfer, and fillet. And uh, with you know a lot of trial and error and a lot of chamfering and filleting and adding and subtracting, I got this part. And I wanna show this uh, to you because it's, it's pretty simple. So I've got my 3D fingerprint sensor that goes right here. As you can see, there is a cable that extends out. And so I wanted to create a little cavity inside my part so that it wasn't getting smashed by the board above it. Then we have these two little plateaus. This is where the board sits upon. I use digital calipers to measure the location of these screw holes on the board relative to my case. And then with, you know, a little bit of trial and error, I put them in the correct position and using what are called threaded heated inserts where I can take my soldering iron, I place it inside the cavity on that brass insert, which heats the brass up, which then heats the surrounding plastic and the brass sinks into the plastic. And then as it cools, it solidifies with the plastic around it, meaning that I can put in a very fine threaded screw and it's not going anywhere. It's extremely strong. So I'm using M2 machine screws to hold my motherboard into the case, which works really, really well. I did have a problem with the lightning port, however. This is a very, very, very small part. And fitting a screw or a threaded heat insert, it just wasn't going to happen. It wasn't working well. And so I decided to do what I hate manufacturers doing, <laughs> but I can do it again and again and again because I've got a 3D printer. And that is create a plastic weld. Plastic welds are, in short, a barbarian plastic post that you heat up and make really, really, really hot, and you purposely deform it to the point where, as it cools down, it grabs onto whatever it is surrounding. So I have two posts that go through each side of the connector, I heat them up, and that holds the lightning connector in place very, very well. And then for my cover, I just created a little one millimeter channel that I'm able to slip a back cover on to. The end result is something that is completely enclosed, really quite elegant and does everything I need it to do. Now there is one omission I made very early on. Here is my original model. You can see that I have a little bit of a T, a little cross here because I wanted to retain the clicking functionality of the original keycap. I quickly abandoned that because I discovered that, well, I probably wasn't just good enough of a 3D modeler, but I think anyone would maybe struggle with it, getting stability such that I could get a replicable, nice feeling key press. So I had ditched the keycap altogether. I got rid of the button functionality because it doesn't do anything that you can't do with your mouse or your keyboard anyway. And I left the bare sensor in this tiny little cavity. I think it looks better. I think it's very, very easy. I've just glued the thing in place so I don't have to worry about it moving up and down. This is a solid piece of non-moving plastic and electronic guts. And I think it works really, really well. I decided to make three different models. The logic board on the 10 keyless version is quite small and petite. And so for me, who plans to use this wired because the rest of my peripherals are wired, I wanted it to be as small as I possibly could get it. And because the battery is frankly not that small, but for those that I knew would wanna use this wireless, I made a longer wireless version as well. Now, on the full size 109 key version, the motherboard actually exceeds the length of the battery. And so rather than make a wired and wireless version, Version, I just made one version for both models. Frankly, I think this is going to be much less common in sight and practice than the 10 keyless version because this is the one that comes with the iMac for free. The other one you have to pay to upgrade and so you'll probably see more of these shorter boards. 
With our models created, it's time to finally print them, and I did so using my largest and most expensive printer, my Voron 2.4 R2 that I built from scratch and it took forever, but it's finally making really nice prints, and my least expensive, smallest printer, the Prusa Mini. The reality is, is that this is not a part that's going to be subjected to uh, lots of heat or UV, nor will it be subjected to stress or torsion, so kind of just get crazy with it. Print it in whatever material or plastic you want. We printed it in a lot of different variations, and we've had a lot of fun with making these things look great. And they do function great. It's very dependable. It's very replicable. I'm really, really pleased with the way this has turned out. If you don't have a 3D printer, you can use a service to print parts for you online, but printers are becoming so good and so inexpensive that it's probably time to take the plunge. I've linked some of my favorite inexpensive printers down below. But look at these end results. Ah, I just love it. They look fantastic. I'm super pleased with the way this turned out, but I also, I'm a really amateur modeler. This is really the first thing I've ever made. And so I know that our tech community can certainly one up my design. Go to printables and remix this design. I would love to see what you can do with it. And then show me in the make section, pictures of your finished print if you decide to do this mod. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, stay snazzy.